รายการต่อไปนี้เป็นรายการทั่วไปสามารถรับชมได้ทุกวัยเราอยู่ในเมืองที่มีประมาณ10ล้านคนอยู่ในเมืองและประมาณ 70% จะอยู่ในเมืองนี้ซึ่งหมายความว่าชนบทของเมืองจะไปจาก 3.5 ล้านไป7ล้านในภายใน30ปีเดียวจะเพิ่มขึ้นนั่นหมายความว่าเราต้องสร้างทุกเดือนทุกเดือนสักประมาณ2เดือนสักประมาณ2เดือนสักประมาณ2เดือนสักประมาณ2เดือนสักประมาณ2เดือนสักประมาณ2เดือนสักประมาณ2เดือนสักประมาณ2เดือนสักประมาณ2เดือนสักประมาณ2เดือนสักประมาณ2เดือนสักประมาณ2สนับสนุนโดย AIS ใช้ชีวิตได้มากกว่าใหม่ MG3 ชีวิตไหนสไตล์ไหนก็ฟันยกระดับความแรงและทนด้วย FB Premium Go SMF FB Battery ไฟดีไม่มีทรยศนูสา My o z o n คิดให้ชีวิตสมบูรณ์แบบ London The city of London still has many roads from the Roman times. Yeah. So if we don't design it right, then we will have consequences for many years to come. Mm. So if we look at this investment that goes into urbanization, in the next 15 years alone, 90, 90 trillion dollars, mm -hmm. tremendous business opportunity. Mm -hmm. Then we have to just think carefully how we design these cities, in terms of density, mm -hmm. in terms of public transport, mm -hmm. in terms of building efficiency. These are all big carbon emitters, mm -hmm. and fortunately now, as we design them, many of them in the developing markets, mm -hmm. we have the technologies, we have the funds, we have the know-how to design them properly. It's the will it's a, now. So it's a purely the will. In fact, on climate change, uh, I've come to the conclusion, having worked this for many, many years, <laughs> uh -huh. I've come to the conclusion we don't need more PhDs. No. We certainly don't need to send anybody to Mars for the answer. <laughs> uh, we can do it today. Mm -hmm. And and countries like China, which I wanted to come back to, mm -hmm. have already discovered that in order to continue their economic growth, which mm -hmm. you s you can feel very well in this region, yeah. if it works or if it doesn't work, mm -hmm. is actually increasingly um, limited by these planetary boundaries. Mm -hmm. People are asking for better quality air to breathe, mm -hmm. uh, better quality water to drink. Mm -hmm. Uh, the industry itself needs access to resources, mm -hmm. and obviously, fossil fuel for many countries is becoming also a security issue. Mm -hmm. So, transforming these economies to green economies, China now investing half of their the global investments in solar or in wind are actually happening in China already. You see this conversion because of these restrictions that are already starting to happen on the economic growth. But Beijing is still quite. Cloudy and hazy. Have you been to Beijing recently? Oh, I go quite often, and it right. used to be. Uh, it used are to be. Doing, uh, are they really doing anything about it? Well, the first time in my life when I went to China, I went to a city of Guangzhou, and I came out Guangzhou. of the train station. Uh -huh. I came out of the train station coming from Hong Kong. Uh -huh. I could not see the other side of the road. If oh. you now go to these cities, it's actually slightly improved. Really? Of the 20 most polluted cities, the top 10 are actually now in India, uh, oh. and unfortunately, Delhi. Has the distinction of being the most polluted. Uh -huh. China is aware of the problem, uh, mm -hmm. as are other countries now, and and is taking action. Mm -hmm. But it takes obviously a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the coal plants are being retired. It mm -hmm. is true that some others are being built, mm -hmm. but actions are being taken to move this economy mm -hmm. now in their new five-year plan that just came out mm -hmm. um, to move this economy quicker mm -hmm. to a green economy. Um, China is going to host the uh, G20 next uh -huh. year, mm -hmm. and that's a major part of their agenda. Are they doing everything that needs to be done? Is the speed fast enough? Uh, the future can only tell us that. Mm -hmm. But they were very courageous to come out with a um, intent to introduce a carbon market mm -hmm. as of uh, 2017 mm -hmm. to be implemented by 2020. Some parts of China already have carbon markets. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, increasingly, you see a leadership coming from there. I would also strongly suggest that if that leadership is in China, then the Chinese need to exhibit that same mm -hmm. uh, attitude uh, in their investments in other countries. And if these countries increasingly do so, mm -hmm. you will see a transformation of the economy. We also need to create that kind of awareness in Bangkok. 
Any advice for Bangkok? Oh, I think the people of this world increasingly are connected. You are an open economy, you are a connected mm -hmm. economy, your profession helps connect people. Mm -hmm. uh, people are well aware. If I go to the one young world, uh, mm -hmm. and, and again tomorrow morning will it be evidence, they will be ahead of us when it gets to creating a more sustainable and a more mm -hmm. equitable future. Mm -hmm. And people increasingly are looking at a GDP plus. We cannot just measure success in producing more things and consuming more things. Mm -hmm. Increasingly success uh, of, a, of, an, of a sustainable world for all mm -hmm. of us is measured by quality of air, by mm -hmm. safety increasingly yeah. so, mm -hmm. by uh, quality of schooling. And these demands and the broader definition of what economic growth should look like is very much ingrained in this millennial generation. And I think increasingly you will see that companies mm -hmm. who want to play on the global stage, and mm -hmm. you have major companies in Thailand as well that export and depend mm -hmm. on foreign markets, mm -hmm. will have the signals from the marketplace yes, that, uh, that they will need mm -hmm. to adapt. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not surprising to me that when uh, Jim Kim from the World Bank came out in the, uh, in the UN Climate Summit in New yes. York, uh, with a statement for a price on carbon mm -hmm. that we had about thousand companies join and make mm -hmm. these statements as well. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, the financial industry now, we have 24 trillion dollars of money in the financial industry calling for a price on carbon. So the world is changing. I think we're in mm -hmm. a much better place now, not where we need to be, mm -hmm. in a much better place now than what anybody thought was possible two years ago. But like with so many things, uh, reputation is not built on what we say, reputation is built on what we do. Right. And Paris is a milestone and it is an agreement and we will debate afterwards if mm -hmm. we are happy with that agreement or if it should have been a little bit more or less. Mm -hmm. That depends sometimes on what side of the mirror you're on. But what I'm focused on now with the business community uh, and as chairman of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development mm -hmm. or member of the UN Global Compact, how can we ensure mm -hmm. that when that agreement is being reached in Paris, that the business community and others are going to overdrive to deliver? Um, the how do we communicate with the man on the street about this? Because the international meetings, Paris, UN, all sounds very good. Yeah, but it's a step removed from, from the reality. That's right. How, on a day-to-day -day basis, how do we create that awareness? The best thing to make it come alive is to really um, uh, um, distill it down to simple steps that individuals mm -hmm. can take. Mm -hmm. And as individuals are aware of these individual steps, then you can multiply that globally and it becomes small steps, big differences. Mm -hmm. If we would say to all citizens when they brush their teeth, turn off the tap instead of letting the water run. So these change habits are, are actually in everybody's uh, potential or everybody's reach. Mm -hmm. And there are many efforts going on around the world now to enroll people in that. Mm -hmm. uh, either we do it with our brands, which are great examples of that, which for us is the best tool to do it, mm -hmm. or we do it with other uh, tools like, like these uh, three or four day discussions with One Young World would be a good example. And you have social media to spread? Uh, social media is, uh, we have a created a uh, site uh, which is called Collectively. Mm -hmm. where people can come in and make their pledges. We have uh, a bright future site created by, with Unilever itself. We have over 400 million people participating mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. So once you create these movements, it mm -hmm. goes fairly fast right now. And social media is definitely one that helps us. Mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then we would, uh, no substitute for uh, two other things. Uh, continuing to advocate for change. Yes. So to increase the awareness. Mm -hmm. Creating alliances mm -hmm. to accelerate change and working with governments to embed that change by mm -hmm. working on frameworks and rules, laws and regulations. And it's a fallacy to think that business doesn't want that, responsible business wants that. Mm -hmm. um, it's sometimes the irresponsible businesses <laughs> that don't want that, but fortunately the majority of businesses in this world are good businesses. Yeah, but when you announce the policy of doubling sales but cutting down by half the environment uh, footprint, it was a very bold uh, decision because mm -hmm. at the time it was quite doubtful whether you, you know, you were really just saying it because you think it was yes, a fashionable right. thing to do. Absolutely. Did you have an action plan? Absolutely. Plan A, plan B, if you couldn't achieve the goal, you could possibly, you know, change a bit, adjust here and there? What, no, what made you decide to just say, I'm going to make it? the policy of Unilever? Well, I'm a father of three children 
and, and I have a bigger responsibility than just our shareholders. I've always felt that and I still feel that today, mm. even stronger so. Mm. When I came to Unilever, actually the bigger challenge was to get the company to grow again because yes. we were actually on a global basis yes. going down. Uh, since then, yes, we Your shareholders will be asking you the same question I'm asking you. So the shareholders are happy because actually from a business that was going down, the business is growing 30% now. Uh -huh. So uh, in that period, so there is a real turnaround uh, because I think of bringing a stronger purpose to business. Mm -hmm. That purpose is also more relevant. Huh? If we say we're going to reach a billion people improving their health and well-being, which for us is part of that sustainability, mm -hmm. it means teaching people more hand washing with Lifebuoy, bringing people more, women more self-esteem with products like Dove. Mm -hmm. And that at the same time grows our business. Mm -hmm. It's linked. Mm -hmm. If you do it responsibly, there's mm -hmm. enormous markets out there. Mm -hmm. The people uh, you take, um, Another example of health and well-being in this country would be our yog brand for breakfast. Yeah. Half the kids that go to school in this country uh, don't have breakfast, mm -hmm. the most important meal in the day. We've reached three million people in this country mm -hmm. to help change the habits of having breakfast. Mm -hmm. They go to school, learn more, better pay attention, healthier lifestyle, but at the same time our brand is doing very well. Mm -hmm. So these are good examples of where you link that sustainability mm -hmm. with your brands mm -hmm. to join prosperity. Mm -hmm. The 800 million people that still go to bed hungry are a major concern to us. Mm -hmm. By addressing that with our products, mm -hmm. we also grow our own business. Mm -hmm. The six million children mm -hmm. that die every year still below the, from below the age of five mm -hmm. of simple infectious diseases like diarrhea and pneumonia, mm -hmm. which we can avoid at least 75% of that with the simple act of hand washing. Mm -hmm. That's why we've reached 400 million kids mm -hmm. in schools, mm -hmm. teaching them how to do their hand washing. Mm -hmm. Not surprisingly, our soap business like Lifebuoy is doing very well. Mm -hmm. There's still two billion people in this world that have to deal with the issues of open defecation, their dignity, their respect, mm -hmm. women exposing themselves to many more dangers. Mm -hmm. So our Domestas brand helps build toilets. Mm -hmm. As we build toilets, our Domestas business will be doing well. Mm -hmm. So which comes back to my original statement that I said before, there is no business case in enduring poverty. So if we link our businesses and our brands mm -hmm to solving these worldly issues for society, mm -hmm. then it is much easier for us also to, over the longer term, satisfy our shareholders. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there is no long-term model. Mm -hmm. The reality of what we're facing today is that with this short-termism, this quarterly obsession yeah. with results, makes that not only CEOs are there less than four years nowadays in mm -hmm. office, very difficult in this volatile world to apparently steer their companies, but the average length a lifetime of a publicly traded company mm -hmm. has dropped to 18 years. Uh -huh. We cannot solve the world's major problems, which is really what business originally was invented for. Business mm -hmm. wasn't invented for the shareholders. Business no. was invented to attack some of the challenges out there mm -hmm. and, and respond to those. That's really, it's mm -hmm. a contract with society first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And it is inconceivable for me that business can be a bystander in a system that gives them the life in the first place that system being society. So we focus on that and then it's obviously for us to be able to measure our steps, take our decisions in such a way that all of our other stakeholders, including our shareholders, will benefit from that as well. What I want people to understand by Unilever other than a company that sets an example of what responsible business is and, and should be then I think we can be proud of having made a little bit of a difference and we can say to our children and their children, we didn't steal from you, we just were stewards and we're handing over to you something that was better than we inherited. And that's really, that should be the goal for all of us. สนับสนุนโดย AAS ใช้ชีวิตได้มากกว่า r o c k w o r d 
เชื่อว่าบรรยากาศของออฟฟิศที่ดีมีผลต่อการดึงศักยภาพที่ซ่อนอยู่ออกมา Inconceivable for me that business can be a bystander in a system that gives them the life in the first place. That system being society. So we focus on that, and then it's obviously for us to be able to measure our steps, take our decisions in such a way that all of our other stakeholders, including our shareholders, will benefit from that as well. So you have uh, KPIs to measure all oh, your sustainability projects. Absolutely. When I became a CEO. The first thing we did really was we waited a year before we announced it because mm. I came in from the outside. But I also thought it was very important that our own people were <laughs> behind that. If you don't have your own people, as you know right. from your business, if you don't have your own people behind it, yeah. it's very difficult. Yeah. So we used that year to measure in the value chain the impact of all of our products, mm. the impact on packaging, on water, on waste, on CO2 emission. So we got the footprints from all of our products, mm -hmm. and we realized that where we could make the biggest interventions, or sometimes the easiest interventions, mm -hmm. to have the biggest impact, and that obviously guided us. Then, when we put our plan out there, our Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, we again had 50 measures mm -hmm. that we put out publicly: sustainable sourcing, uh, health measures, nutrition measures, mm -hmm. for example, issue of stunting. Mm -hmm. um, Hand washing, sanitation, mm -hmm. uh, water, how many people we wanted to reach. Mm -hmm. So we put out 50 measures. These measures are public. We, we put them on our website. Yep. These measures are audited by PwC in this case, one of the auditing companies. Mm -hmm. Because I also believe that in this age of, uh, of lack of trust, which we really see, uh, trust in the institutions, mm -hmm. trust in business, trust in civil society, if you want mm -hmm. to at, at some points, mm -hmm. uh, trust is low, which is one of the major issues that we have to tackle some of these global issues. And the only way to move this planet forward to the benefit of all is to re-establish that trust. And first and foremost, that mm -hmm. starts with transparency. Mm -hmm. You can't build trust without that transparency. And mm -hmm. that trust is obviously then that basis for longer term prosperity. Mm -hmm. In Thailand, we would have to still do a lot of work before that general awareness uh, is there. What would your advice, uh, practical advice be? How do we spread the, the word? How do we convince the business uh, community that sustainability is good for your business, good for society? Yeah. Well, we have some of the companies here that understand that. We have some of them that have joined the Global Compact, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. In every country, you have leaders and laggards. And here in Thailand, you have leaders as well, mm -hmm. uh, not least the population first and foremost, I would not underestimate that force for change. Mm -hmm. Most of the changes in the world now basically happen because people speak up, especially the young, and you see that in all parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Then you have leading companies that obviously uh, need to continue to set the example, mm -hmm. uh, work on industry associations. Often it is uh, better to work together than mm -hmm. to sometimes take the risk and exposure alone. But increasingly, we are at a situation right now that we can tackle many of these issues, not necessarily all, but we can tackle many of the issues with alternatives that are actually cheaper mm -hmm. than what many people do currently. And often the awareness is low. We have seven factories in Thailand, as an example, mm -hmm. and all these factories now are zero waste to landfill zero. because we've designed zero. them to zero waste to landfill. It actually turns out to be better and cheaper for us, uh -huh. not more expensive. Mm -hmm. We move in Europe everything to green energy, mm -hmm. turns out to be cheaper. Mm -hmm. So we're at the point also in this part of the world mm -hmm. where we will find economic models, growth models for companies mm -hmm. that are better. And I think if you don't do this, you run the risk that you become very rapidly uncompetitive at a global level. And you're willing to share that experience? We. Uh, as open as can be. There's not a week that goes by that we don't have people visit our company mm -hmm. to see what we're doing. We actually go further than that. Our, our Rexona deodorants, we just launched compressed versions mm -hmm. of that, again, for environmental footprint. We make the patents available to everybody because we think it's so important. Mm -hmm. That is a bigger issue for us to solve it mm -hmm. than seeing this as a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. the, the, the price of the common good for us is higher. Mm -hmm. So we have been uh, yeah, fairly active in trying to see if we can convert these markets. Unilever is 83 years in Thailand. Correct. It's one of the Correct. corporate institutions of Thailand. You mentioned Unilever, everybody knows. 
Right. So there is a responsibility there, right? Absolutely. To take the lead. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It was uh, Viktor Frankl, uh, he was a Nazi camp survivor, and he wrote a book uh, called Men in Search for Meaning. Mm. And in right. his book that you might remember, he yeah. said when they built the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast of the United States, they forgot to build the Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. You cannot have <laughs> liberty without responsibility. Mm -hmm. And Unilever, which is a Thai company by, by any standards, mm -hmm. uh, I think we have that right to claim that after 83 years here, and that's mm -hmm. our way of operating, has an enormous role to play, and mm -hmm. it does so mm -hmm. uh, in many of the projects. Mm -hmm. Just in livelihood alone, mm -hmm. our uh, Unilever network has 280,000 people working for yeah. them. Our Walls ice cream has 5,000 people in the streets. Yeah. So our offices here have uh, 4,000 people. Mm -hmm. So just on the livelihood measure, uh, we work with NGOs in, in conflict zones where women are sometimes put at a disadvantage mm -hmm. and a brand like Dove is an ideal brand to work mm -hmm. with that. So we've mm -hmm. always seen our role in Thailand as well as in other countries in the world uh, to make this a, a society, any society, better for the long term mm -hmm. for everybody. Mm -hmm. That's our strength and I hope we will not lose that and certainly not as long as I'm CEO. Mm -hmm. On the business side, how is this year's business going to be? Well, we have, uh, uh, as a company, we have always challenges. The global economy is not an easy economy. Mm. I think everybody deals with that. Uh, the economy in this country is probably is a little bit more headwind than tailwind mm -hmm. at this point in time. But again, we look at it over the longer term. Unilever has 60% of its business in the emerging markets. Uh -huh. uh, that's where the population grows is. Mm -hmm. Even if the emerging markets are slowing down a little bit, the aggregated growth is still 4%. Mm -hmm. uh, Europe or the US would die for that. Yes. So when everybody writes about a slowing down emerging market, you have to put it into perspective. Right. And then obviously our main focus is to develop these markets. We are mm -hmm. at our best when we help people mm -hmm. uh, to help people be lifted out of poverty. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in that part, we still have a lot of things to do. And that's why the sustainable development goals are so mm -hmm. important. And that's why we feel so committed to be part of that and making them come alive. How important is a Thai market to your global oh it's a big market we have a big business here if our global business is a little bit north of 50 billion yeah. the Thai market is 1 billion which is quite sizable All right. mm -hmm. uh, if I do uh, if I visit every country uh, 50 countries only to make my turnover <laughs> so that is 150th of my time should go to Thailand right. in that sense yeah, you so haven't it's an important spent that much time here uh, oh I spend a fair amount because I enjoy <laughs> it actually so <laughs> uh -huh. but uh, no it's, a, it's an important market mm -hmm. the changing technology changing consumer behavior how do you cope with it people younger people consume in a different way now the way they shop yeah. the way they absolutely uh, so decide to <laughs> buy or what not to buy has changed totally in the past only up the past 10 years or so yeah no and it's not the technology that changes it it's the adoption of technology yes. so what you have to be really careful about is what is adoption and what is technology. Right. Otherwise, you and I and our professions can get spinning for hours and hours <laughs> right. and uh -huh. make major investments every year. Uh -huh. So we look at adoption. Mobile is a great example. That's an adoption thing. Whilst there's a technology aspect on it, habits are changed when people adopt. When the farmer gets the telephone, he can see the crop prices, mm. he can change his income. Mm -hmm. uh, when the woman gets paid, like M-Pesa systems in Africa on the telephone, the money isn't taken away from her and she can put it into nutrition and her family. Yeah. So things change because of adoption. And we try to be on the intersection of that adoption. Mm -hmm. I just read a book uh, recently that is called Exponential Organizations mm -hmm. uh, by a guy called uh, Salim Ishmael. Mm -hmm. And Salim is talking about these enormous disruptions that are happening in the industry with the Ubers, the Airbnbs, yep. mm -hmm. the, the fintechs mm -hmm. in your industry and mm -hmm. uh, with digitization. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to be mindful of that. We see the same coming in into our industries. So the way we deal with that is to keep our minds young to stay humble, mm -hmm. to give the younger people more of a voice, mm -hmm. to make the organization at the same time more uh, uh, agile, mm -hmm. but as well resilient. Mm -hmm. Because we're living in a world now that is much more complex. Forces are coming together mm -hmm. that make it much more difficult. Geopolitical forces, climate change forces, yeah. the technology forces, the financial world's forces. Mm -hmm. uh, currencies going up and down by 15, 20% is normal nowadays. Um, so this world is what many call a Fuka world, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. Compared to when you were younger, about when you were 30, 40 it's years old, um, running 
Would you wait with uh, Procter and Gamble uh, and Nestle yes, too before that's that? That's correct. That's correct. And now, the role of a CEO. It's totally different. In fact, the the changes that I've seen, if I may uh, reflect on this, in the last uh, two or three years, are probably more than I've seen in the previous 30 years. <laughs> yeah. So the challenge for us is actually uh -huh. not as much to learn only, but also to unlearn. Right. That's often a bigger challenge. Right. And um, and keep ourselves on our toes and put a system around us that uh, is capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of time on in the digital space. We are hiring different mm -hmm. people with these capabilities. We're developing different business models. Uh, our uh, Aviance products here or uh, Unilever Network with mm -hmm. the 280,000 uh, uh, entrepreneurs that work for us uh, together with us uh, are examples of these agile networks yeah. mm -hmm. around the core. And uh, so we're looking at our business model continuously on how we can stay ahead. The proportion of your revenue from the digital platform, is it growing in a very clear manner? No, absolutely. If you um, actually, if you see, and again, it's the younger generation, but uh, there are some countries that are taking the lead. Mm. But surprisingly, mm. uh, it's, it's coming now in many places you, uh, with different models. Mm. But the way that the Alibabas or the Tencents yeah. in China yeah. have exploded, mm. um, it might not be more than uh, sometimes 5, sometimes 10% of your business, sometimes a little bit less, but it's fast growing. And if mm. you miss it, you might miss all the growth in your business. Mm. And you know how important mm. that is. Mm. So you have to be there. Uh, you have to adapt your products. Yeah. You have to adapt your uh, relationships with mm -hmm. your uh, mm -hmm. consumers, if you want to, mm -hmm. uh, and and often uh, it's not just buying on the internet; it's a, a total experience that comes That's with right. it, uh, where people go onto the net for different reasons, mm -hmm. then end up with your brands with solutions, mm -hmm. a little buy now button. So you have to have this consumer journey and accompany them, and that has become a little bit more call it complicated, a little bit more touch points, but it's a little bit more... Uh, fun. Fun, exactly. <laughs> we, we should not uh, shy away from that. Uh, huh? So now people ask you, Unilever, what would you like them to think? What is the image you would like people to have about Unilever now? Uh, well, obviously we have a mission as a company to make people feel good, look good and get more out of life. I think that mission is becoming increasingly more relevant in this world with the challenges that we've talked about. I simply have a, uh, not, not a, a big ambition for what I want people to understand with Unilever other than a company that sets an example of what responsible business responsible. is and, and should be mm -hmm. for generations to come. Mm -hmm. That we show that business can be done differently to the benefit of everybody. Mm -hmm. And if we can make a small contribution to that mm -hmm. and evolve, uh, capitalism as we know it mm -hmm. uh, and make it more inclusive, make it more sustainable mm -hmm. and certainly make it more equitable, mm -hmm. then I think we can be proud of having made a little bit of a difference and mm -hmm. we can say to our children and their children, we didn't mm -hmm. steal from you, mm -hmm. we just were stewards and we're handing over to you something that was better mm -hmm. than we inherited and that's really, that should be the goal for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank, you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.